Welcome to The Halo Effect, hospitality stories with Ashley and Michael Donald. With over 40 years working in the hospitality industry, we've lived some incredible experiences and as a husband and wife team, we continue to forge our path through business and life that continues to present challenges and opportunities. Through this podcast, we would like to share these experiences and provide some behind the scenes insights into the world of hospitality and entrepreneurship. We hope that this will help anyone who is on a similar journey by sharing how we forge our own path through this incredibly rewarding, yet often challenging industry. So Mike, um, this podcast is very much rooted in the stories of hospitality. So perhaps could you tell us about your journey and how you got into hospitality? Yeah, I, you, you would think it's not a very traditional journey to, to end up in, in hospitality. But then again, I don't think many journeys are traditional uh, when they go into hospitality. Um, I finished school and not really sure what I wanted to do, um, but I knew I wanted to go to university. So I did that. I did a, did a degree in philosophy and history um, and then ended up in hospitality. <laughs> um I think I did the the usual looking for some sort of work. Um, ended up working in um, Croke Park in Dublin, uh, where the the home of uh, GAA in Ireland. Um, working in a in a bar, just basically I was employed as a glass collector and and decided to promote myself to a to a bartender on the first day when they said glass collectors stand over there and bartenders stand over there. <laughs> nice so, oh, promotion. I'll I'll, I'll I'll do that. I think after about five weeks or so, I said, "Can I please be paid as a bartender as well?" Um, but that was kind of the first, the first one. And then, and then I remember getting a, well, applying for, for jobs in a, in a hotel and I had to, um, it was a job as a porter. And I remember asking uh, a friend who worked in hotels and had worked in hotels since he was quite young. I said, what, what does a porter do? Um, and, uh, he said, well, you have linen porters and luggage porters and, uh, kitchen porters, uh, but Judging on the size of that hotel, I would imagine a porter is will be all of them. It'll be everything. So yes, I would be serving breakfast. I'd be running up and down stairs, getting the the linens. I'll be putting luggage up and down the stairs, um, and having to do a bit of washing up on, on occasion as well. Um, and that same friend, after a few years of of, of doing that, um, invited me to apply for a job in a five star luxury uh, resort. Um, nice. which at the time was the Western Turnberry Resort and is now um, Trump Turnberry. Um, and it is something that I, I suppose I didn't really realise that at the time, but I, I guess I was emigrating at that point because I haven't moved back to Ireland since. Um, and uh, it was it was a completely new world. It was a um, luxury hotel, I remember being asked, uh, by the operations manager JP Cavanagh, who's now the um, GM of the Shelburne in Dublin, and he, he asked me, "So what? What does what does five star luxury really mean to you?" And I think I said something about anticipation at that time, which I thought was quite intuitive mm-hmm, of me. I thought much. I still I still probably say something about the the same. I I, I should have asked him what does mm. what does five star mean to him. I'd be interested. Maybe we'll be able to find out in this podcast. Um, and anticipating what people really want to have from their stays. And actually, I learned more and more about that um, working in that in that property because it was, what, 800 acres, mm. um, 200 X number of rooms. Um, but I also met someone called Ashley Brayshaw, <laughs> um, who was working in the marketing team at that stage. Um, and we were became friends <laughs> at that time. Um, but um, Ashley then moved moved off to be in Thailand. Um, and I soon after moved down to London, where I ended up working in a, a, a another hotel, um, part of the Starwood chain, uh, which was the Park Tower. And I started, I think, for the first six months or so, I probably spent about four and a half, five months just working night shift. Um, and there's nothing that gives you more insight into the human condition I can not only imagine the stories that you've gathered in that period alone of working a night shift yeah. at a busy central London hotel. Yeah, it's um, 
Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty <laughs> Winter intense. Winter and New World. Well, I I, I remember because I was a huge fan of uh, Faulty Towers growing up, and I remember just wanting to tick off all the experiences <laughs> that were that had happened in there. And I, I think in that six months, I probably ticked off ev- every single one. Um, so highs and lows, it's a bit of a roller coaster. Um, and also, it's it's I find it very hard to get to know a city as well when you're doing night shifts you certainly mm. you, you learn a certain amount about the city because on your on your days off you're, you're yeah. kind of I, I always sort of stayed in that in that night shift kind of timeline so it, it was quite sociable actually for those days <laughs> off um but it it was a I, I i i was promoted after about a year just over a year um to role of reception manager and that gave me a real taste of being responsible for I guess the careers and the development of of the team, mm-hmm. um, which is a massive part of hospitality. You know, if you can, in in fact, it's it's everything, isn't it? Because yeah, if you it's can, such a people business. If you can have your team working as a team um, for the for the betterment of the guest experience, then it's it's going to make a, a huge impact on on customer experiences, and, and ultimately, that's the most important thing. Um, well, it was about six years in the in the Park Tower, and then moved to the Goring. So I was kind of looking for an opportunity to do something a little bit different. And the Goring, I had only really known about as being the place that uh, Catherine, uh, the now uh, Princess of Wales, um, stayed at the Goring the night before her wedding. And I remember watching it on television in the Park Tower, and I didn't really know too much about the going, but obviously I got to know it very, very well in the period of time that I was there. Um, family-run business. Um, Jeremy is the the fourth generation going to to run the hotel, mm. and it gave me a completely different insight into luxury and yeah. and the amount the amount of effort and and work that goes into making seemingly simple things work really well all of the time um the dedication from the from the team there the hours they would put in um the into the minutest uh, detail um to make sure that guests didn't even notice mm. um, it was it was is, seamless is. I, I remember we did a bit of a mystery stay didn't we just before you started there yeah, we did. um and that's one of the memories that i really have um of just exceptional service and um if you recall we arrived and we were greeted at the door the biggest smile from the doorman and he took our names and welcomed us and at no other point did we share our names with anyone, yet mm. every single person that we met, yeah. whether that was at reception, whether it was in the bar, whether it was breakfast the following day, whether it was the housekeeping team and the corridors, greeted us by our name, which mm. I just thought was incredible. Um, and for me, it was really refined service but with real character and personality which I think again comes from I think the family heritage and I think it is the last family owned and run hotel in London perhaps or one Uh, of yeah it's it's the it's the the last um, luxury hotel in London that's still run by the family who who built it or started it that's incredible um, which is is amazing amazing legacy what is what is what I love probably the most about it is despite the incredible service um, was a sense of humour behind mm-hmm. everything. Um, it's it's something you don't always associate with with high-end hotels. Yeah. You think stuffy. You yeah. think snooty. It can be a bit you intimidating, think, can't it, as a guest? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we have, have to, it was the same sort of like golf clubs where you have to wear certain clothes mm. and there was strict dress codes and um, I remember we went for afternoon tea in the Ritz once and we had to, you know, strict dress code in there. And then you feel like you have to behave like you're being watched. Um, and, and certainly lots of guests would come into the going intimidated. Um, they'd come in for an afternoon tea and they'd be they were not really sure. Mm. Um, and it didn't take long for them to hear the stories and relax and, yeah. and realise that, you know, it's the, the people who work here are the only ones who have to wear the three-piece suits and... And all of that, but you can you can really relax. I mean, yes, if you're going into the dining room into a Michelin star restaurant, you probably want to be relatively smart. Um, 
but there was no strict dress code in there um and and the sense of humor throughout in every little detail whether it be complaint letters in the the gent slew or the stories of the sheep or stories of the the details and the hand painted wallpaper that and these stories would change all the time depending <laughs> on the on the on the humor of uh, who was telling them um it was it was kind of eye opening in terms of how much you could enjoy hospitality i think um or you could turn it you could make it a little bit more exciting in that sense and and i think it really empowered people coming through um to understand that the most important thing was to make that connection with mm. with customers and and humor is is a brilliant way of 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 breaking the ice and 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 making that connection if yeah. you can do that early with someone um we talk about the halo effect on the halo effect uh, <laughs> but if you could break that early um it makes a huge difference yeah very much so and i think it it's really interesting that you have had that experience of as you say that really personalized and refined service in a very high-end luxury hotel with such personality um but also you've had experience of working for a, a global hotel company and all of the structures and support um and processes mm. um and also at a very high-end you know knightsbridge hotel and mm. actually i think that has really kind of set the scene for the support that you're able to give and the perspectives you're able to share with our clients and our yeah. industry friends that you can see it very much from all sides and almost sort of cherry pick and, and create a bespoke yeah. plan for, for our clients, which I think has, has helped us no end. The the idea of, of process improvement within within guest experience or processes that go on behind um the behind the scenes to to offer the guest experiences i think is is absolutely absolutely crucial the the whole and it doesn't have to be massively complicated um we did both um do our fair share of six sigma um when we were at uh, starwood and that kind of involved a little bit more into sort of innovation um but i think sometimes it is it, it, it is it is simple you 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 see a process you measure it you get feedback whether that's guest reviews or surveys or whatever it might be you find out what what are the big miss and what's the big miss what's what's going wrong here what where why am i when am i dropping a score if you can find that i i I always love the the metaphor that um one of tiger woods's old um coaches um used to talk about and he used to say you know you want to eliminate the the big miss if you can if tiger is is hooking it into the trees every every 10 holes then that's he's going to lose he's going to lose shots that way but if if um there's something wrong with your your breakfast if the breakfast pl- if the plates are cold at the buffet if you can eliminate that if you can make sure that the breakfast plates are warm then their whole breakfast experience is going to be better and if your breakfast experience is better and it's the only meal that people actually have when they're staying at the at the at the hotel then it's going to have a knock-on impact on on everything else in there. So you you find what your big miss is, you fix that, you measure it again, you you find out what the next big miss is, and and you just slowly but surely go through that process of um, process improvement. and And everyone can do it. We can do it in our personal lives, and we can do it in in work. But it's um, sometimes just having that that opportunity to step back and reflect and use the tools yeah. that you already have and i think having the, the backup of the data as well because again you know hospitality is such a people business the emotions the decision making is very intuitive but i think to have that mm. data and to reflect on that guest feedback and as you say find those key drivers that are going to really push the needle to deliver an overall positive guest experience so um you know we we work very much um in tandem with our clients to look at um you know troubleshooting through their guest reviews and you know whether that's TripAdvisor or through booking.com or, or through google increasingly so as well they've overtaken TripAdvisor in terms of the amount of reviews that they're gathering so um 
you're supporting them through that sentiment analysis and really finding out okay what what are the best things that and what are the positive sentiments what are the things that you can improve on and realistically what impact will that make on the overall guest experience so I think yeah as you say using that data um, having those structural processes in place that Six Sigma methodology um, but also overlaying that with that goring personal touch I think it's a a really great combination and has Mm -hmm. um, kind of brought that experience into Halo that we can ultimately then share with our clients Absolutely Um, Yeah it was and then of course we decided to leave London when we decided to leave London it was it was it was yeah taking out those elements of our experiences together um to create something new and different and something that we could offer offer the uh, offer our new clients and new customers um took a while for us to actually sort of think of i think mm. i think we had to step back from it a little bit like we, we've we've yeah. come a bit more comfortable with the idea of of this makes sense and it does when we say it now we're like yeah of course it seems obvious but at the time um it's very easy to see customer experience as being quite different from sort of the marketing experience before and the marketing communications because they are so segmented in so many different businesses and industries. Mm. Um, and they can be quite siloed as well in the actual operations of the hotels, yeah. particularly if they're a bigger organisation. It's almost seen as the them and us yeah. in certain situations. Oh, well, that's the, the marketing and they sort of sell the promise and we just have to deliver it. And yeah. it can sometimes feel slightly disconnected. Mm. Um, so I think it was great for us to, yeah, really, as you say, step back and reflect on how you can actually bring these together and, and offer a really elevated experience. Um, and I think to kind of galvanize those skill sets w- w- with with our hotel clients and, and help them um, be more I suppose in, in, in synergy um, and, and and working together. Thank you for listening to The Halo Effect, hospitality stories with Ashley and Michael Donald. Hope that this has helped fellow hospitality people and entrepreneurs who may be on a similar journey. If you would like to suggest any topics for future episodes, ask us a question or would like to join us on a future episode of the podcast, then please get in touch. We've linked up our contact details in the show notes. Don't forget to like and subscribe or follow The Halo Effect on whatever platform you listen to your podcasts. We look forward to welcoming you back to the next episode of The Halo Effect, Hospitality Stories with Ashley and Michael Donald.